Good evening, everyone. Muito boa tarde para todos. Uh, welcome uh, to another session of the 47th annual Luso American Education Foundation Conference uh, that began uh, exactly 47 years ago, actually in the city of San Diego, was the very first conference. And the conference began as a product of bilingual education. So 47 years ago, actually around 50 years ago or so, the um, bilingual education was uh, a huge success in California. And it was um, a, a time where we still had quite a few immigrants coming from Portugal, from the Azores and Madeira. And so many students needed the bilingual education system coming from uh, a different country to California. And a product of that, thanks to Eduardo Eusebio and a group of uh, bilingual educators uh, throughout the state began this conference as a conference for bilingual education. And uh, then uh, it, uh, it, it then, of course, turned into a different conference uh, throughout the years. So we are happy to have you on board. Uh, we are going to be talking about Portuguese language teaching in California. We have uh, two uh, uh, of the uh, language teachers. We might have a third one join us in just a little bit, but uh, we of course uh, are happy to have uh, the Portuguese language teachers from the state of California. We invited uh, nine different teachers. Uh, we had some of course uh, regret because they couldn't be uh, present. We had uh, a couple of them with maybes uh, and we had seven, uh, we had four who did not even answer. So um, that, that the Truth is always a good thing to start off in a kind of a uh, of a presentation. But I want to welcome. We have a veteran teacher and a new teacher, and that is great because we have both experiences um, to to talk about in, in the next few minutes. And so we have uh, uh, with us uh, Clemente Fagundes uh, and Gonçalo Souza, and both of them are Portuguese language teachers. Uh, Clemente teaches uh, full time Portuguese and has for many years now, and um, Gonçalo is just a brand new teacher in the Los Angeles uh, school district and is teaching math and, of course, uh, picked up uh, one a course of Portuguese, who, which I'm sure in a few short years will probably turn into two or three or four. So I'm going to ask um, Clement first, if he doesn't mind taking about uh, three to four minutes or so to kind of um, basically uh, introduce himself. I think people here in the central San Joaquin Valley know who Clement is, uh, who Clement Fagundes is, but some folks uh, throughout the state may not. Uh, tell us a little bit about himself, his immigrant story here to America, and of course, a little bit about uh, his classes at uh, Mission Oak High School. Well, good evening to everyone, and uh, uh, thank you, Nish, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here to, uh, representing Portuguese teachers in California. Um, uh, as uh, you just stated, uh, people around the valley here, you know, pretty much know my story, but uh, it's, uh, I immigrated when I was 10 and a half from the island of Terceira. I was born in Alguava in Terceira and immigrated with my family. I'm the oldest of uh, four siblings, two sisters and one brother. And we first landed and were, lived in Merced for two years. Then we, as we know in, the, in those times, uh, our parents had to travel to where the work was, where uh, there would be cows to milk, Vikings Bordignad. And so then we moved and went to Strathmore, lived there in Strathmore for four years, and then finally ended up in Tulare. Uh, lived in Tulare until I uh, was about ready to get married. And, and at that same time, I started a dairy business. So I am not uh, a project of teaching as <laughs> high school right out of college. I uh, did a lot of dairy work as an employee. And then eventually for 19 years, I owned my own business, dairy business with my brother-in-law. Uh, lived in Hanford for five years. And then for the last 23 years, I've lived in Visalia. I, uh, I took a break from after high school from getting uh, my degree and eventually decided that probably feeding cows and milking cows wasn't, uh, I needed a backup plan. Let's put it that way. And my backup plan was to go back to school, 
really not sure of what I wanted to do. Uh, maybe real estate, maybe, uh, yeah, I wasn't sure, but finally I settled that I wanted to be an elementary school teacher. And I took my liberal studies degree, part-time classes while I worked, while I had my family. Uh, it took me a long time. I uh, joke that uh, uh, it took me 15 years. <laughs> and I said, oh, that's a long time. Yes, it is. And I kept on until I ended up getting my um, degree. And I was set. I really liked teaching elementary. I had subbed and did a long term for elementary schools, and I really liked it. But in 2010, um, Mrs. Bentoncourt, who was a, a Portuguese teacher at Western, was retiring. And probably like Gonzalo, even though he, I believe he speaks better than I do, but I knew how to speak the Portuguese language and they needed a Portuguese teacher. Also, they knew that I was working on my credential. And so I got hired at Western and the new school at, uh, in Tulare, which is Mission Oak, going between both schools teaching Portuguese one and Portuguese two. And then the other levels went to the niche at Tulare Union. So niche taught all the levels, one, two, three, four, and occasionally five. Um, at that time, um, I, it was, it was kind of different for me because I really wanted, really thought I wasn't ready to teach high schoolers, but I grew into it. And I, now if I look back, I probably wouldn't want to teach except maybe high schoolers, even though they make my hair turn pretty white, <laughs> but, um, but, you know, I've grown to, to, um, to, to enjoy teaching high schoolers. Um, when we started Portuguese, it was just uh, myself and, and Mr. Borges, Nish Borges. And again, I went between the two schools. And, but it was a time, and I, maybe Nish could add to it, especially the second year, my second year, my third year, was the biggest growth of students we had seen in probably a long time. I remember my third year, we had about 440 students taking Portuguese, about 220 in, uh, that uh, Borja, uh, Niche took care of, and about 210 between my two schools. And, uh, and at that point, because it seemed like it was such a great number, we actually decided, or the principals decided to bring in another teacher and have me just solely go and teach in, um, at Mission Oak. And I've been on Mission Oak now, this is uh, my 14th year teaching. Uh, so solely without going to Western, I've, it's been my 11th year because I did the first three going back and forth. And now I teach, I uh, have been teaching, I think um, Portuguese um, one, two and three for the last uh, 10 years. Uh, close to that, uh, and two years, three years ago, I actually had enough students to teach a level four, the Portuguese four. So, I've always, it, it's the numbers never been as great, or the students amount of students as great as back in that. Uh, probably was a 2014. The numbers kind of stable, kind of gone down. But I've been fortunate, especially in the school that I work with, to maintain at least always giving, uh, taking, uh, having five classes of Portuguese, um, which is before the new, con uh, now we, our contract here at Tulare Joint Union High School is that we have to teach six classes, so six sections, but before that was five. So I always thought just the uh, uh, Portuguese. And then when we, uh, uh, turn into the block schedule. They call the block schedule. So on us an hour and a half uh, um, classes, an hour and a half per class, but the kids are allowed, they could actually take eight classes. So it's the block schedule it makes it to where our contract now it's six classes. And I've been able still to maintain five classes of Portuguese, but I had to add one uh, which is called a PE class for soccer, which I also coach soccer. So it kind of, uh, kind of worked out well to do that. Yeah, indeed. Uh, um, we, uh, uh, 
between Clement and I, we had over 430 students, and um, that can kind of seem to be insane, but it wasn't. Uh, to I believe that uh, it was a mistake for them to hire a third teacher at that particular time because it was working out really, really, really well, and it was just kind of a capricious part of by one uh, one administrator in particular that wanted to have his own um, his own uh, Portuguese language uh, teachers, but teacher. But I think that it was working out really well. Clement enjoyed going between both schools because it kind of gave him a bit of a break, you know. Um, but uh, but hey, um, those were the numbers uh, indeed. You know, 2014, 15. In 16, we had those numbers, and then it's, they 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 have dwindled a little bit. But Clement has been able to keep over. I think you have over 120 students, correct, in taking Portuguese. I've, I've had I, this year. I have a, 136, and last year I had right. also 130. So yeah, I've been able to maintain that number consistently. And uh, Gonzalo, uh, a little bit of a bio about yourself as well. How do you, you ended up in America and how you ended up teaching Portuguese? Hola, boa noite. Good evening. Uh, my name is Gonzalo and I apologize. I live, I live close to an airport and there's a helicopter that has been circling my house. So hopefully it doesn't come by while I'm talking. Uh, <laughs> but yet again, good evening, everybody. My name is Gonzalo Souza. I was born and raised in Portugal. Uh, and I moved to the United States eight years ago. I was 14 at the time. I came uh, to high school. I finished high school here. And then I went to college up at UC Santa Barbara. Uh, up, I say up because I moved here to Los Angeles uh, originally. And that is where I live now. So I'm telling the story temporarily completely wrong. Where I go back? I come here to high school in Los Angeles. Finish my high school, I go to college at UCSB, and I graduated, uh, I got my degrees in economics and Portuguese. So I, I took it upon myself to, it was uh, it was something that I made sure to do ever since I stepped foot in the United States, was to not lose contact with the Portuguese language. So going to college, knowing that there was a Portuguese department at UCSB, and I became friends uh, with uh, Professor Correza. Uh, so it, it made sense for me not only to study it because I wanted to keep contact with the language, but it made sense to study it because I fell in love with Portuguese literature. So uh, when I was finishing my, my degrees, it came time, and that's when my dad started asking the tough questions of what now, son? Um, and I always had a passion for teaching as well, so I thought this is the time to do it. I... Uh, applied and got accepted to uh, the Gravette School of Education at UCSB. And just a couple months ago, I completed my credential and master's in education, which allowed me to this year start teaching. I am a month and a half into the profession. So it's, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here and get to share my experience. And it's a privilege to share the space with such veteran teachers with with such wisdom and wealth of information uh, that I can learn from. So I'm very excited for, for that aspect of it. Uh, I currently teach one Portuguese course. Uh, it is the, the only foreign language course that isn't Spanish that is taught at my high school. I teach in Los Angeles Unified School District at, I believe, I don't know, you can fact check me on this, but I think at the smallest high school in all of Los Angeles. We, we are just shy over 200 students. So the whole high school has less students than you teach Portuguese. <laughs> yeah, we are a very, very tiny community. Uh, and my group of 12 Portuguese students in Portuguese One, uh, I have to tell you, they are an incredible group. Uh, and I think this discussion and this conversation will be very fruitful because we'll be very different groups of students. Uh, up in the valley, you get Portuguese heritage uh, all over. And I know that that influences your classes because people come with a home knowledge of the language, home knowledge of the culture. I have none of that. Quite the contrary. I have students that are, some of them are interested and curious about Portugal, Portuguese, Portuguese language culture. Others have never heard about it and are just discovering it for the first time. And it's uh, a challenge that comes with a lot of excitement. So, um that's excitement is something that I bring as well. <laughs> well, and you certainly bring the excitement, and that's the excitement of a young teacher. Uh, uh, and uh, and I'm not saying that Clement's not exciting, and I'm not excited, <laughs> but not, you know, not like uh, that. Not <laughs> uh, we have Luis Nunes also on the line. Uh, he is, of course, uh, 
uh, teacher of, and has been, I believe, also for about 14 or 15 years, um, at, uh, at least at uh, San Jose High School. But Luis's camera is not working, but I think you can hear us, Luis, correct? Maybe he cannot. Anyway, I see Luis is on and he sent a message that he was uh, here, but he could not have, he could not get his camera to work. So Luis, if you can hear us, um, you're on mute. So maybe if you can unmute, we you can still participate. Obviously we won't be able to see you. If I can find a picture of you, I would put it up there. <laughs> I see that Luis is unmuting himself, but the audio is not coming through. So I don't know if his microphone is connected. Yeah, that might not be that. Okay, well, Luis, if you if you do um, resolve the issue, we'd love to have you, of course, be part of it. But we can um, we can, of course, um, uh, see that you're on. But uh, as Gonzalo said, I believe the microphone your microphone is not connected not connected as well as uh, your um, as your camera. So I don't know if you want to stay on or if you want to try logging on again. Um, anyway, we were going to continue then with. Um, with kind of like a, a first question. And we, uh, in a way, um, Gonzalo uh, hit that kind of towards the end there when he was talking about his classes. So um, kind of a, a brief comp uh, composition of your classes. Um, are they all Americans of Portuguese ancestry? We already know from, from Gonzalo that they are not. Um, but uh, if not, and I, I'll start with you, Gonzalo, because uh, we already know that they're not. Um, why are they taking Portuguese and um, um, why are they interested in the language? What have you heard from your uh, class of 12? Why, what drove them, other than your enthusiasm, of course, <laughs> that, what drove them to, to want to take Portuguese in Los Angeles in such a small yeah. district? I made sure to ask that question on the first day. It was one of the first things that I asked because I was curious about myself. How, do, how does a student come to that? A lot of them, uh, they were they were quite honest with me. Uh, a lot of them was they were wanted to try something new. They didn't know what it was about. They were just curious and they had the free period. So they were like, why not? That seems like fun. Uh, and th I think that was most of it. I think mo most of my group was, you know what? That seems like fun. We'll give it a try. Uh, I had one or two uh, that truly had that interest through the Spanish language. They were like, I already know Spanish. That is my home language, or I took it already for three years. I want to challenge myself. I want to make sure that I add to my repertoire. Um, and I actually, so a lot of, only one or two students truly have that desire of, I want to add that extra language. But talking about my class of 12, half of them are Hispanic. So half of them bring some sort of knowledge in the Spanish language, some of them very primitive, uh, others fluent and fully fluent in Spanish. And I see that as a big, big push and a big help for them to, to do that first connection with the language. Indeed, and they're, they're, uh, and I'm gonna turn it over to Clement because I think uh, that he can add a lot to that as well because I, I would think that more than half of his are not Portuguese and quite a few of them are Hispanic. And I'll also share a little bit about Fresno State because that's, although it's college level, but there's still a lot of connections with high schools. Clement, your situation. Well, it's, uh, I would say right now, I kind of made some notes from the questions you sent and it's about 60, 70% are Hispanic in my classes. Um, maybe this year, maybe a little 60, but I've had 70%. Um, and, and about, 5% other or two, maybe not, it doesn't reach 5%. And then 30 to 40% um, have Portuguese uh, ethnicity of some kind, uh, usually third generation, fourth generation Portuguese. Um, what's the interest? Well, in, for the Hispanic students, just like Gonzalo said, it's uh, I have quite a few, especially in upper levels, or, if, or they are already starting in like Portuguese too. They've taken Spanish classes. They've actually passed the AP test. And then they kind of said, well, maybe I want to try something different. And they do come into my class uh, uh, to take Port Portuguese because they feel, and, and a lot of times it, it, they become successful on acquiring that the Portuguese language and being trilingual 
because of their knowledge of the of Spanish. Um, other Hispanic students who start from a Portuguese run right off is again they already have the background knowledge of, of Spanish, and for them they they just say it's an easy class, uh, and it usually is for them. I actually have my uh, Portuguese American students who struggle more than the Portuguese students, than the Hispanic students, I'm sorry. Um, um, the, and, and I have a great bunch of, of kids this year that are Portuguese descent. They are from their parents or in their forties, mid forties or so. And they're very involved, for example, in festas, you know, they're kind of type of kids who love to go to the vacadas. That's their thing now is to go to the vacadas and be that part of entertainment for them. But they do lack a lot of, uh, of the language and uh, knowledge of the, the culture is kind of basic. It, yes, I like the vacadas, I like sopas and some things like that but it doesn't expand any further than that. Um, and it seems like they actually struggle quite a bit sometimes with the language. I have one case, one of, I guess one of my frustrations lately, I even had this student that uh, last week I uh, called, uh, you know, just not doing well in class. So I called the, the counselors. I got to do something about this student. The student's a sophomore. And so the counselor says, call home. Okay, I'll call home. And when I called home, the first, one of the first things that uh, the mother tells me is that the grandmother, who is fluent in Portuguese, is telling the grandson that I am not teaching their Portuguese. So, <laughs> so <laughs> I'm pretty sure your mother or the grandmother of this kid is from the island that I was born, Terceira. I am not speaking with a Brazilian dialect, not at all. I'm, but it's, it's, there's that kind of attitude in our community that uh, we're teaching the correct Portuguese, but it's not the correct Portuguese. I don't even know how to state it that in any other way. <laughs> so, so. <laughs> That's a that's a bit better than uh, than the one phone call I always remember. I was my first year teaching, and I had a very a Portuguese American young man who was who probably is responsible for a lot of this gray hair, even though that was thirty plus years ago. Um, and I called the mother who said, "If you can't handle the the my students in your classroom, then maybe you shouldn't be teaching." So at least they were nice. Oh. To even <laughs> that one. But I had, oh, wow. yeah, I, that's, after that's... that, I never called any parent at home unless I had. Oh, wow. I mean, Portuguese yeah. parents, I had some some issue with it. So, um, and I continued teaching and did well. But anyway, um, <laughs> it, sometimes you it, you don't. I mean, it's just you know uh people uh have uh different uh perspectives on things i think luis is unmuted so luis welcome and if you don't mind giving us a little bit of a the same idea composition of your class i know that of course in san jose things have changed immensely at one time it was just mostly all portuguese but that's not the case today correct i don't think we are having success with luis uh, I thought he was able to uh, unmute himself, but uh, it's not coming through. Well, we'll continue. <laughs> uh, sorry about that, Luis, and uh, technology is sometimes what it is. So indeed, um, I just wanted to add two things to uh, what both of you said. Of course, college levels is a different situation. Most students take the class because they need those units or they want those units. Um, it's not like they are... Um, it's not like they are there because of a friend is there. You know, sometimes that happens, you know, in, in, in high school. Hey, my friend is taking Portuguese, so why not take it with him or her? Um, they are uh, indeed all uh, taking uh, uh, Portuguese because of different reasons. In my language class, it's a full class because in college, they only allow us to have 25. I had to petition to, for two more, so I have 27. And uh, the majority of them, like both of you, a majority of them are Hispanic students who are taking Portuguese. So that's my my majority of my composition. In my, I teach this semester in a, a, um, as a 
culture and history and literature of the Azores, which is kind of a real fun class to teach. It's in English, unfortunately, because uh, readings we do are translations um, of poetry and and of and prose. And uh, um, I have twenty five, also a full student, full 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 body of students, which was unbelievably uh, interesting um, because the class has been taught twice before and one time I had like seven students and another time I had like nine students lit classes or small classes as Gonzalo probably remembers from college you know even at CSB you know it's not like you have you know big big lit classes but uh, I have 25 and I and 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 11 of them are not Portuguese or related or you know anything to do with Portuguese and I I was always I was curious why are you taking an Azorian culture class? Lit, and unless they're lit students, but they're not. They're not literature students, they're not English majors, they're not, you know, they're not uh, uh, in that field. Some of them are NAC, some of them are a business, some of them are um, social science, some of them are liberal arts to be teachers. And quite interesting in the piece that I got from them that they wrote for me from the first day of these 11, uh, two of them said they were just curious. They're Hispanic and they're just curious about another culture. And the other nine said this wonderful thing that I've been preaching for years and finally heard from someone, which is the the importance of the Portuguese diaspora. They said, my, one of them said, my neighbor down the street is from the Azores. I want to understand something about that culture. Or I go to the Portuguese festas. I don't know anything about it. I want to understand that culture. Um, my best friend in high school is Portuguese. He's in another college now, but I want to... I want to understand a bit about his culture. I've been friends with him since I was five years old. So sometimes we forget, including in Portugal, that these five million souls that live outside of Portugal are Portugal's best ambassadors, and are uh, and they they don't have to be Cristiano Ronaldo with all due respect, and he's great at what he does. They don't have to be a diplomat. They do not have to be a famous scientist. They're just everyday people that in their lives, in their neighborhoods, are proud to be of Portuguese ancestry and, and create bridges with other ethnicities enough that these ethnicities want to learn a bit about who we are. So kudos to all of us. Uh, I have some information from Luis. Thank you for sharing, Luis. And I'd like to share that with you. So Luis uh, has um, uh, various classes, of course. He has, uh, I believe, let me look here. He has uh, 120 students. Um, he has uh, one international, of course, Portuguese one, Portuguese two. He has one third year class. He has the international baccalaureate uh, level, which is unique. And it's the only school uh, that teaches Portuguese in the entire state of California. One of the few in the nations that has an IB program. 85% of his students uh, in San Jose of the 120 are Latino. Um, and he only has five students who wow. are Luso descendentes. Only five of us. In San Jose. <laughs> San Jose. <laughs> because the San Jose community has moved. They're, they're now all over the different areas. And of course, he's at high, one high school. And I should say, Luis does an outstanding job. He's one, he's a, he's a, he's a really a, not just a great teacher, but also a leader in education. So thank you, Luis, for that update. If, if I can add, st still on this point, I, I, I'd like to add another another comment on this because I talk I, I talk, talk to you about what my students told me on the first day. So we hadn't done any classes yet. So that was really what draw, drew them to write their name down and sign up for that class. Ever since we've had six, seven weeks, maybe now. Wow, time flies. <laughs> uh, and one of the big things that has fascinated my students, and that one actually came in the first couple of days as you're giving the intro and the general, they were fascinated at the fact that it's a world language. Uh, and you, you talk about the, they were fascinated with multiple aspects of this. Not only that, there are multiple countries that speak Portuguese besides Portugal and Brazil. They were completely unaware of any others besides those. But then when I shared with them, because it is part of my research, uh, the fact that Portugal is an immigrant country. And as you just mentioned, Dinesh, we have a million that live spread out everywhere. Uh, so this this idea of a, of a, dia a diaspora, not only of the Portuguese people, but of the Portuguese language, was absolutely fascinating to them. They loved it. They they jumped right on it. And I tried to bring map. I, I'm a bit of a geography nerd myself. I play flag games for fun. I try to identify all 193. Uh, so I, of course, I bring them flags and capitals and maps. And they they loved it. They were like, how how do you how do you get here? How do Timor is like on the other side of the world? 
so that, that was a big draw to try to connect these, these disciplines and bring geography in. Uh, and uh, as well, if I'm allowed a second extra note, uh, yeah. it's on that idea of the, of the correct Portuguese. Um, and although I am as well, I, I have my, my rib, my patriotic rib, uh, I have many, but, but a very strong one for sure. But I also cannot understate the importance of Brazil as a, as a pop culture dri uh, driver. Uh, it, it is, and uh, Denise, you and I have had uh, many conversations about the fact that the Portuguese culture failed to become mainstream and failed to, 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 to hit that. Uh, Brazil is succeeding. And I have students that have come back to class saying, oh, I'm, I'm starting to have Portuguese TikToks show up. Uh, so uh, that, that presence online and pop culture cannot be understated. I, Brazil, yes, comment, please. Well, I just wanted to add on that about especially the, the little videos, because one of the things, especially with our kids in high school, you know, they have that cell phone with them all the time. Right. And they it, I have to tell them 20 times, 50 times a day to put the cell phone away. Uh, but then I've, I've, I've said to try to. And I only tell them that because I know what they're doing is not learning with it and they're not. If they, and I've told them this many times, because there's so many TikTok or YouTube little videos, one, two minute videos about Portugal, about Portuguese language, something if they would want to learn. If they would actually go to that and try to learn it, but they won't. And But but I have soccer, Hispanic kids, that since I have that soccer class, and, and they will come up to me, and, and because they like soccer, Brazil, they have kids in Brazil that are doing these TikTok, TikToks, and they're coming to me and saying these phrases and these things, and of course, sometimes I have to say, well, I really didn't want to hear that word <laughs> in particular. But it, it kind of impress, impresses me that they're actually at least uh, they're getting the knowledge uh, from these athlete, uh, athletes from Brazil and actually trying to acquire and speaking the language somehow and by, you know, looking it up or the little videos or the little TikToks when sometimes our own uh, lose American kids won't do that. And I try to in, in, in force them to, if you come to my class two, some weeks, three times a week, we spend an hour and a half, but then why don't you try to practice either through some videos, through some family or through someone, some of the things that you actually have tried to teach you, maybe you actually acquire the language that uh, indeed, and 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 I to add that, um, uh, uh, Luis, and thank you so much, Luis, for uh, being participant uh, through chat. And so he uh, wanted to just to share that with everything, uh, with those of you who are not uh, following us here on um, Zoom and are following us on uh, Facebook Live. Um, he exactly mentioned that that he totally agrees with both with both of you. He has more and more students showing up speaking Brazilian pronunciation from playing those games and watching, of course, the TikTok videos. And as he said, I think it's pretty cool. Um, I'm fine with them speaking with a Brazilian pronunciation. I'm fine with them speaking as long as they're speaking Portuguese. It doesn't make a difference, of course, the pronunciation. It really doesn't, uh, you know, and I, and I think that sometimes, uh, you know, Sometimes we in Portugal, and when I mean we, the three of us are not there, but uh, we in Portugal, as uh, those who were born there and, and, and came over here, depending of our age, we know by the contact with the country that sometimes it's more of our problem than it is the other problem. I mean, there are, th there are instances at all levels, uh, you know, but I mean, one of the prior presidents of Portugal once went to Brazil and said that they weren't speaking Portuguese. And I, you know, <laughs> oh my gosh, you know, we don't want to say that to uh, anyone who makes an effort, first of all, but especially to a country of 200 plus million people. That is basically the reason why we are the fifth most spoken language in the world mm -hmm. is because of Brazil. Take the Brazil out of the equation, even with the folks in Africa and, and Asia, I mean, but you put those together and, you know, we would be, if at best, like the 45th or 50th most spoken language in the world. It's those 200 million people that that that, that elevated it. And I, 
I think, I mean, I don't understand sometimes within our own community when people say, well, I don't want my grandson to learn Brazilian Portuguese. You know, my grandson doesn't live here. He's actually going to be turning 18 pretty soon. And he's uh, he, he took Spanish because there was no Portuguese. I would be delighted if he spoke Brazilian Portuguese or Angolan Portuguese. You know, I would be very, very delighted. It's Portuguese. <laughs> it is. It is. Let's ask. Let's talk a little bit about. I mean, we're talking about uh, the present there, but um, what are your and and Gonzalo, we'll start with you again in this aspect because uh, um, when we talk about prospects for the future, my gosh, you're just beginning, so you have all the prospects. It's a small um, high school, but I'm sure you'll your with your enthusiasm. If you have twelve this year, next year you'll have triple, um, and so. Um, how do you see the teaching of the Portuguese language in your area? And I would ask if you have any information on that as well, um, Gonzalo, uh, in your high school, as you said, it's a small charter high school, but um, even in LA Unified, we have a plus there, which is Alberto Carvalho being uh, the superintendent. The uh, when, uh, We have a lot of superintendents, fortunately, throughout school districts in California. Selma here south of Fresno just got a superintendent who is Portuguese, Edward Gomes. We have Lucy Van Sayak, where, of course, uh, at the Tillery Joint Union High School District. We have um, Victor Halsa in, uh, in Hanford, Hanford High School District. We have, uh, uh, I can't think of his first name, Mr. Barlow, uh, Silveda Barlow, as is, uh, uh, who is a um, uh, the superintendent at, at King's uh, 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 schools, Kings County schools, and we have three or four superintendents also in uh, the Northern Valley area, Turlock, uh, of course, Hillmar, uh, and a couple other places as well. Um, what What are your thoughts on that, Gonzalo, as you start? Do you think that uh, with, with your enthusiasm and, of course, with the students wanting to learn, that there's room to grow of Portuguese in your school, even though it's a smaller school, as you said, and even the possibility of you going into a bigger school with more opportunities to teach a language. Is there, do you feel that there's, that if you start with these 12, this might grow and other schools might want to do the same? I certainly think so. Uh, right now it's all prospects. As you're saying, Denise, I just started and I am a big dreamer and a bigger doer. And you just got to go after it. Uh, and to, to share also about my personal story, I, I came to LAUSD and I came to the school that I teach at. I teach at Daniel Pearl Magnet. I, I came here because I was allowed to teach Portuguese and because I had a belief from uh, LAUSD and my administration at the school. And they took a vote of confidence in me and in the Portuguese language and said, yes, let's do it. And that is the reason why I did it. Uh, I, I was very, very committed to, to the teaching of, of the Portuguese language here in California. Uh, so that in, even within my school, my little tiny school, I see big, big opportunities for growth. Uh, part of it is the, 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 the inner working of the school and their, their objectives. Uh, my school is a magnet for journalism and communications. Uh, and it is the, the dream of the current administration to grow the language department, which was non-existent. Uh, they, they have, we, we teach Spanish, or we have taught Spanish like any other school in, in California, but the, the, that was the full extent of the language department. Uh, we have, I think, I don't, I don't even know how many languages we have at that school. Our students are from all over the world and the ones that are from the United States, from all sorts of backgrounds. So it is a, a polyglot school. Absolutely. It just, it, and I'm happy that uh, now we are seeing the, the, the steps being put in place for it to grow. Uh, and then my work within the school is uh, a lot of that, of attracting people to, to the Portuguese class and to the Portuguese language, because the idea is if not next year, having Portuguese, having more than one, by my third year, certainly having more than one Portuguese class. Uh, and I, I have no doubt that that will happen uh, within my school because I, I, I will certainly be working for it. Within LAUSD as a whole, I, I saw that push. And I, I, I saw that push all the way from the, from, from the top. And that is why I was, uh, that was one of the reasons uh, why I was hired and why I made that, that choice. Uh, I am the first Portuguese teacher, Portuguese language teacher in LAUSD, uh, but we have two already. Uh, I, I, I beat Flavia de Monaco by 30 minutes. My period started a little bit before hers, so I still get to claim victory. <laughs> so we have two currently, but there are prospects for growth. When we were having these conversations six months ago about who's going to teach Portuguese, we had uh, 
five potential teachers. That ended up being two this first year. But on a first approach, we had five. I'm sure that on a second approach, we'll have 10. And maybe of those 10, we'll have two more. So prospects for growth, absolutely. Indeed, and we'll come back to a little bit what you said there, but Clement, what, what are your thoughts at, um, at uh, Mission Oak, where you're at, but uh, even in the district itself, uh, what are your thoughts as far as the growth of the language? Is it pretty much grown to where it's going to grow, or is it going to grow a little bit more, going to become stable? What are your thoughts? Well, um, I have mixed opinions on this. I, I think it's probably the growth is going to be stabilized pretty much. I, I would say this. As long as the Hispanic interest in, in our language is there, we will be able to man, maintain uh, the way we and stabilize. If we ever lose that uh, ability to, uh, of those students that not showing interest in our language, uh, I don't see the future of having three Portuguese teachers in our district anymore. Honestly, uh, again, I'm just being really honest here. Also, um, I also see a few issues that probably when I started 14 years ago, I would say even back seven, you know, six, seven years ago, still I wasn't seeing this again because of the uh, keeping the numbers. I'm seeing uh, sometimes a mixture of levels together. And I think that it is not beneficial when you put a level three with a level four and the curriculum in level three is one thing, the curriculum in level four is another thing. Plus it is an honors class. And if students are doing the same thing in those classes, and then at the end of the semester, a uh, student in Portuguese three gets uh, an A, student in Portuguese four gets an A, but gets a, uh, the student in Portuguese three gets a 4.0, the student in Portuguese four honors gets a 4.5. I think that is not a good thing. I think it, it, it hurts uh, the program and, our, uh, and, and the numbers and the, and the students in our classes. So in these kind of factors, I, I, I kind of, again, I just really hope the Hispanic students um, stay with us because if not, then I think we're going to suffer. Uh, it's, a, it's a total different animal, Portuguese for honors to Portuguese three, not just, be, and because I taught it for so many years, not just only because, but also the level of the, the, the interest of the student, because someone who takes Portuguese for honors really wants to be there in four honors. Sometimes students who take Portuguese three, they're just getting that third year just so they can impress it on a university entrance. You know? So yes, it's, it's a total different, uh, yeah, that may not be a, bad, a good word to use, but it's a total different animal in the, yeah. in, the, in, the, in the aspect. I mean, it's a total different composition of a student. You're absolutely right, Clement. Absolutely. And I, I wanted to bring both of you into this part of the conversation because, you know, with uh, uh, Gonzalo mentioning, you know, he has about also about half who are Hispanic. With Luis mentioning 85% of his students were Spanish, uh, Hispanic, uh, with Clement talking about, you know, around 60 to 65% who are Hispanic. And that's the composition of the state of California. And I don't understand uh, anything to do, I don't understand the when it comes to the political aspect of, of, of promoting Portuguese, because everything, unfortunately, is political. Um, they are our best customers, folks. Um, Portugal, the government of Portugal, should be doing a heck of a job promoting Portuguese within the Hispanic population. That's exactly what we are trying to do by, by bringing in, um, we have not been very successful, but we're going to keep on trying as, as, as Gonzalo, uh, I, share, I share that uh, enthusiasm with Gonzalo, although with about, you know, a 40 year time span, which is uh, the, the belief that uh, I believe that we could get, if we get Spanish teachers who teach Spanish and who are usually native speakers of Spanish, who are usually from Mexico uh, or from other Spanish speaking countries to have a Portuguese, be able to get also credentialized in Portuguese. My God, that would open up a whole world of uh, these 
districts from Los Angeles to San Diego to San Francisco to other areas that are not teaching Portuguese. No district, as, as Gonzalo just proved, you know, he was hired as a math teacher in order to do a Portuguese component. He wasn't, they were not going to hire him just to teach Portuguese, obviously. It's, it's that, that dual thing. So if we were, if we are able to convince these districts, and I have half a dozen about now, right now, superintendents in the Valley who are convinced that, I, that I've had meetings with. If we are able to convince these, 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 these uh, students that they, uh, or these superintendents, that by having Portuguese, they're doing a service to their Hispanic yes, population. Yes. Why should those kids be learning a language they already know? Make them trilingual. By, you know, they will be, these Hispanic native speakers will be true trilingual and we ha and we will be able to not just double not just double we'll be able to quadruple easily the number of students taking portuguese in california high schools we um i have um and, and that's completely all true I, I, and i think educators lose that and, and and i know some of the areas that you're talking about that should have portuguese already and it's not because they're portuguese communities it's just the fact like Gonzalo's, once you you uh, you present, you will have that other option. I have a couple of Brazilian, recent immigrants from Brazil at Mission Out, and they come and visit and we talk all the time, but they're, they're not taking my classes. They speak perfect Portuguese. They just immigrated two, I think three years ago. So they're taking Spanish and that's fine because now they already are set and they're uh, in Portuguese. They are still taking a little bit EL because they are actually need to learn English a little bit. And then at the, at the same time, they're taking Spanish, which is going to be pretty simple for them and easy. And all of a sudden there, there, there's these two young men who are going to be trilingual. And, and in the other, in reverse, we have the Hispanic students that I spoke about earlier. They have their language. They've passed their AP. They're, they're done of what they need to learn in, in high school for the Spanish language. And now they find another option in our high schools taking Portuguese. Those students can and can be very easily become fluent or close to fluent in the Portuguese language. And they're set with three languages. And, and a lot of this should be able to provide that. Gonzalo, your thoughts? Yeah, it, it, I think the overarching argument here and the, the, the bigger problem is, and I'll direct it at an overall United States problem of not investing in any kind of foreign language teaching. And, and that, that trickles down to us. Uh, because if, if you have a, a, a pluricultural country like, like no other, or like very few others, uh, and you box yourself to the teaching of one language, the English language, you are alienating more than half of your own population. Then if you want to take a step ahead and say, no, then language teaching is important. Let's analyze the populations that we have and let's analyze how we can best serve them. I absolutely agree with you, Dinesh. There is no reason why we take a state like California um, that half of the people here already speak Spanish. And then we mandate that these kids go to school and take Spanish from fifth grade onwards. And it's, 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 it, it is a disservice. It is a disservice to our own communities uh, to, to do it that way. There's an, an understanding that language. Um, we, we can talk about what is the importance of language? Oh, you get to communicate with other people. You get, yes. And I, I said that in a joking voice and it almost sounded like I was undermining all of that and very much not. I, I just want to add on top that we make ourselves bigger people. We think in language. There's language going inside of our brain from left to right. The more languages that we know, the more and faster connections can we make. So it, 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 it's, uh, it, again, I'll, I'll finish with the, the, the sound bite. It is a disservice to our communities to not invest in more language teaching, and especially bridging this, this, these two communities in, in, in South America, the two big languages of South America, would be a brilliant idea. Well, and, and I believe that maybe we in the Portuguese community need to make that a cause. And we don't have causes anymore. Unfortunately, I've been here long to say that, but we, we, we do need a cause. You know, when, when we would have a 
earthquakes in the Azores that destroyed a lot. We had a cause to help the people rebuild their homes. And uh, fortunately, there hasn't been major and uh, construction is, of course, much different than what it was, you know, 50, 60, 70 years ago. But the cause of, the, of teaching Portuguese language it needs to be a, a, a unifying cause in the Portuguese American community, not just to our kids, not just to our grandkids, not just to those who have roots in mainland Portugal, the archipelagos, or any other Portuguese speaking country. But I think we need to say, you know, the only way this is going to grow, the only way, if I have, you know, <clears throat> if we have 15 or 20 students at uh, XYZ school in um, in Santa Clara, let's say, California. If we have, you know, tw uh, 15 or 20 students of Portuguese background that want to take Portuguese, they're not going to start a class. But all of a sudden, if you do an interest session and you have 80 Hispanics that want to take Portuguese along with those 20 Portuguese, then you have 100, then you can hire someone. So I think mm -hmm. that we in the Portuguese community, I agree wholeheartedly with you. Our, our language policy in the United States is horrible. But I think in the Portuguese, knowing what, what, that it is what it is, I think in the Portuguese community, we need to kind of make it, um, we need to kind of make it a, 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 um, uh, a cause. Let's have more Portuguese and let's promote it within the Hispanic community because that opens up, let's be a bit, a bit selfish as well, that opens up to our kids. Because if you have, if you only have fifteen or twenty families, I mean, Luis is a prime example. If he only had teaching Portuguese, and of course you the same thing, uh, uh, um, Gonzalo. If it was going to be up to teaching Portuguese, well, you wouldn't be teaching twelve students, and Luis would only be teaching five instead of one hundred and twenty. Yeah. And Clement would probably have to be divided between three high schools because he's the yeah. oldest teacher at Tulare Union. The other two would be out of a job. So uh, that's that's a simple fact that sometimes we don't understand. I wanted to add all just what uh, Luis added, and I think it's important to it comes along with what Gonçalo was saying which is we unfortunately to start earlier yes indeed it's just like in Portugal now they start learning English in the fourth grade there is no reason the the uh, example but it's only one in California of the immersion in Hilmar is phenomenal because they start learning Portuguese in kindergarten so I mean I have talked to kids I just recently <laughs> seventh grade and he was doing i mean we carried on a very good conversation because he has been six years teaching portuguese mm -hmm. uh, i mean learning portuguese so we have to start younger when they're sponges and they absorb it you know at a different uh, cognitive level than they do when they're already 14 or 15 um uh, wholeheartedly and uh, and as uh, as we said some of the problems also with languages that we can run into this problem in the portuguese community or in the portuguese language as older retired teachers retire from, this has happened with German, this has happened with French, this has happened with other languages. As older retired teachers uh, leave, they shut the program down. Uh, this has happened, I mean, this has happened with, I would say, dozens, if not mm -hmm. hundreds of schools that used to teach German. Uh, we don't have hardly anybody teaching German here in the Valley. And at one time, there were you know, like almost 20 different programs. And now there's maybe one. So this can happen to the Portuguese if we do not uh, uh, recruit big numbers. I tell, I even just recently, we had a, a, a meeting at Fresno State. We're talking about endowment. We're talking about, you know, the oral history pro project. We're talking about that, talking about that. And I said to all the folks, I said, this is all great. This is all fantastic. I love doing what I do. But if my classes aren't full of kids. This is worthless. I have to have we have to have full classes at high school and at 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 at, uh, at college. If the classes are not, you know, if the classes are not full, I mean, if the classes it doesn't have to be twenty five, it can be fourteen or fifteen. But if there's not enough students to warrant a class, then you know, as the programs grow, then administrators mix it. And I thank you, Luis, for bringing that because that's exactly what's happening with other languages. And I think it can happen with ours as well. Older retired teachers. And then they say, all of a sudden, ah, it's too much trouble to find a teacher. You know, we're just going to close the program. So I have to be careful. With that. Let me ask well, you about community. Uh, oh, go ahead. Come on. Based on, you know, this topic we've been speaking about, is we it stems from the question that you uh, asked. What is, what's going to, what do you think is going to happen in 10 years? with the Portuguese language. 
So basically just came around and pretty much answered that. If uh, in 10 years, uh, you know, God willing, we'll all be here. I know Gonzalo definitely will, but who knows for any of us, you know, and in 10 years, uh, sure, there's plenty of intelligent and young people like Gonzalo out there, but they also have to be committed to want to, to teach and love teach the language. If not, it will, you know, we used to have, when I used to be in high school, we used to have German, we used to have French, we used to have Spanish, and where's French, where's German? Nowhere to find. Yeah. We, have, we have the Brazilians to build upon this, as Gonçalo said, and we have to build upon that it is a natural language for Hispanic students, because we're so close, we are yeah. two different languages, but we're very close, and it, it, is just, it just affords them, instead yeah. of them being stuck only with two languages, it affords them the opportunity to be true trilingual students. They can yes. become easier than a, than a German student, than a Russian student, than, than an English-only student. Completely agree. I think uh, I started by answering your question that the prospects are for growth. And I stand by that. There's prospects for growth. But if we continue down the same path that we're going and that we have been going, we are going downhill. We are at the turning point. And uh, Vinizio and I have been having these conversations for a few years, not only about Portuguese language, but about the Portuguese uh, culture and the Portuguese American presence in the United States. And in, in a closed system, we'll just expend all the energy, the atoms will dissipate and it'll rest and done. That's no good. That we're, we're aiming for the opposite. We want to open the system. We want to get that. We want to get further. And uh, yeah, there's it, in, a, in a 40 million person state in California, it's a big number. 350,000 Portuguese and Portuguese descendants. It's a very big number, absolutely. But it is also a very tiny number. So for aiming for those, how many of those are children, and how many of those children in ages to take classes where they're back to Louise's point? Well, how many of those are in the ages that we have Portuguese classes available to them? And touching on that age of sponges, yes, we start teaching them in high school, but we go to high school at 14 years old. And it is at 14 years, give or take, at 14 years old, that we stop being able to fully immerse ourselves in new languages. The whole system's backwards. <laughs> that, 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 that it is. Completely indeed. right. Completely and you just, right. And you just pinpointed again, 350,000 is a lot indeed, but we're, our issue is if there were all 350,000 in Los Angeles or all 350,000 in Fresno, exactly, it would make a difference. But we're right now, according to the latest census, we're in 500 cities in California. 350,000 of us divided by... 500 cities because no longer the, Port the Portuguese people stay in the same town that they're married, you know, we're, we're raised, you know, they go to school, uh, you know, in the, in the Bay Area and don't come back. They go to the school, you know, especially in the Valley, uh, but even outside the Valley, even outside the Valley, people, you know, sometimes are raised in San Diego, but then they go to school in the Bay Area and they get a job in Silicon Valley. They're not going to come back, you know, so it, it's just, it's a different world, but in those numbers, as you mentioned, Gonzalo, you know, 350,000, if we just look at that, it's good, but it's uh, there's not a lot of growth. But now we take those same 40 million and we take that according to the census, it's about what, 18 million who are Hispanic. And we take of those 18 million that at least half of those are Spanish speakers. So all of a sudden we got 9 million people to work with. We can have, a, a, and and, and how that wonderful that would be for our culture, because uh, Portuguese Americans, like all any other ethnic group, are no longer just marrying other Portuguese Americans or partnering mm -hmm. with partners. There are, are Portuguese Americans. You know, there are there are people who have partners uh, or husbands or wives who are of different ethnicities, uh, and many of them Hispanic. Many of them in the, in our community Hispanic because they're the big majority here. And what great opportunity that to have these kids already know the language, you know, and already know the the uh, the, the the culture. Anyway, before because we are almost out of time. I mean, we we go a little bit over, but I don't want to. I know that uh, tomorrow's still a teaching day, and so um, the um, what can our organizations? What 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 do you think our organizations can do to help? whether it be classes or clubs on campuses, 
clubs are great if there's classes. Um, to me, if you have a Portuguese club on campus, but your administration is not willing to start a Portuguese classes, they did with Gonçalo, well, big deal. You know, you can have a club about anything. You can have a sewing club. And so um, the, uh, the clubs are great to add to the classes, but the classes are where the meat and bones, uh, the, the meat and potatoes are there. And so what do you think that Portuguese uh, organizations, we have a lot of organizations in California. We have two major organizations in the United States that are based in California, PFSA and Luso American Financial. We have over a hundred associations halls. Many of them are worth millions of dollars, uh, even in rural areas. You know, there's not a hall or anything in a rural area that's not worth a million and a half plus. Um, and, and, and some of them have funds. What can we do um, as a profession, as, a, as, as teachers of Portuguese, to knock at these people's doors? And, and would it be helpful to have other financial resources? And, you know, it may not help you in the classroom, uh, because uh, school districts have finances to buy books and things like that. But wouldn't it be wonderful if we could pay, you know, uh, the students can't take them to Portugal, or we actually could if, that, if, that, if, the, if the funds were large enough, but maybe to take Gonzalo's 12 students and take them to, see, uh, to U, UC Santa Barbara for a day to experience a Portuguese day with Professor André Correia Sá, or to take them to the Portuguese Hall in Artesia, you know, for a day and they have lunch there. These things take money. You know, you have to pay buses, you have to pay things. So what can the Portuguese American organizations do to help us do even a better job to connect with these communities. Uh, Clement, I know you've, uh, you've uh, you know, advised the club, you've had, you know, Portuguese American organizations have helped us, you know, here and there, but they've been small little things that- Small things. Uh, um, we use a connect, we are, I am the, been the advisor for, for the SOPAs, the Portuguese club or society of Portuguese American students, the, 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 the club that even though it, when I was in high school it was Portuguese club, but I believe you renamed it as SOPAs. And we've uh, held that uh, through all these years. Um, uh, when, you, when we have the club and we have the classes like I have, a lot of the communication with the students or is, uh, is already done in the class to get them to, to participate, to join. Then, but the desire has been less and less. You know, I, I had a, a meeting a couple of weeks ago where we took picture for the year so we're all excited so like 30 students blew my mind away because the month before I had elections and only 14 showed up so what's going on here with uh, 135 students in my classes taking Portuguese and I can't get uh, you know 20 30 students to participate in a soul push um, the the organizations we have connections. For example, we uh, they ask our SOPA students to help serve or to participate in some events, and then in return they usually uh, donate, uh, give a donation, uh, which in a way has been kind of refreshing because a lot of times they were just the kids that were serving in in these events were just added as community service. And usually not a lot of times we're getting a lot of uh, donations uh, for the help for the club. So, but last, especially after COVID, that's been, I think they've realized, okay, we're using these students. They are going to apply that to as community service, but we're also asking uh, a Portuguese club, a Sopas club to come and help serve or help do this or help do that. We are also going to uh, help them, um, pay, you know, give the donation to the club, in which in turn the donation could be used for most of it is usually scholarships or if the school doesn't help for, for example, uh, the trip to go to Fresno State or this or that, then we have to use those kind of funds to do that. But uh, that's kind of more or less the, the connection that we have. I was on mute. I'd love to see every single school, um, whether you have, you know, uh, 
12, 20, 100, 200 students. I'd love to see every, every single school be able to offer at least two or three, if not more scholarships by Portuguese American organizations, just for kids who took Portuguese. Does it make yeah. a difference? Hispanic, if they're whatever. Yeah. If you took exactly. Portuguese for three years, you're going to get a scholarship of this amount from this organization. And we have the funds, and that's how the program is also going to grow. Your thoughts, uh, um, uh, Gonzalo? Well, I, I, it's it's through exposure. It's getting our kids more exposed to the language and to the culture. So if if there were funds so that I could pick up my students and take them. Well, you're right. You, you you named a couple of places either UCSB and sit in in a college class, take them to a hall, do a big trip. Well, I, I have the opportunity to do to do that trip. It was one of the most fun weeks of my life. I took a car out of LA and drove up the valley and then into the uh, the the coast, and, and I toured every every single little spot that I found that had a Portuguese name anywhere written. I was going to stop there and I was going to meet people and say hi. Uh, and it, it, it that was exposure for me, and that's I think what our students need um, for. I, for all of my students, especially in Los Angeles, in the valley where I am, there's not even contact with Brazilian immigrants like you could have if you were down in Santa Monica or Venice, for example. So the only source of input of Portuguese language that my students have is myself. For 60 minutes a day, for well, the parts of those 60 minutes that I am speaking in Portuguese, because it's a Portuguese one class, most of most of the instructions need to be given in English and the, these explanations. So I have made it. I even have a big poster in the back of my room. Mais Portuguese. And I wrote in Portuguese so that I'm changing my brain when I'm reading it. Uh, and it's because I, I realized that the only input they get is me. So if there was a way that we could... Um, I, this is where it gets complicated, and I would need and I would need more creativity to come up with 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 places where we could invest. Uh, but it create more opportunities for our students to to hear the language, uh, which is hard to do to do with that kind of money. So, if we're talking about investment and putting it somewhere, maybe it's backwards. We identified that the problem is we're starting teaching the language too late. So certainly, the first point of investment would be invest below. Let's form teachers. Let's get people to teach this language. But Accepting that we are starting where we are starting, most of our students start in high school, ninth grade or above, let's create possibilities for growth. Could Portuguese be taught at community colleges? And could we get uh, trained lecturers and trained professors that could go to the local community college? And now there's a, an opportunity for growth. Uh, and there's an opportunity for that next step. Where can I continue to speak Portuguese? Where can I continue to take this further? Uh, even if they're going into university, I'll be encouraging all my students, for sure, if they, if they do go on to university, hey, just check if there's a Portuguese department. Check if there are any GEs that you can do with them. And by the way, check if the minor is something that you can do. If you're really interested, think about a double major. Now, of course, we only have a few, you know, by few, again, these numbers always need to be put in context. I say a few, and at the same time, there's a lot of places that teach Portuguese to, to, to our dimension. Uh, there's a lot of places that teach Portuguese here in California. But I really hope there could be more, more places where our students could grow to speak and to learn. Indeed, indeed. And I think that, um, I think one of the things is to make the language, and Clements, of course, can vouch for this. When we, when I was in uh, his colleague, and I still am forever his colleague, but a colleague there uh, physically, um, kids enjoyed some of the fun things, you know, like the visits to universities, whether Fresno State or we went to Berkeley or we went to, no, Spanish didn't do that. So the Portuguese classes did that. The Portuguese classes took you to the universities. The Portuguese classes took you here. Portuguese. Class. So it's kind of you know unique, and so, and we that's how we can build is with that kind of uniqueness. But that uniqueness takes money. Money. And we can invest with all due respect to my Portuguese American friends who I uh, who uh, I uh, respect so much for all that has been done in the community. But if we can invest fifty thousand dollars in a bullfight, we certainly can invest. Twenty thousand dollars in education. Um, you know, I, when I mean a bullfight, I mean you know whatever. <laughs> you know, it can be another event of the festa. We spend a lot on our festas, and they're an important part of who we are in the United yeah. States. But there are there's funding out there, and I think we have to fund it uh, because unfortunately, it's not going to happen the other way around. I wanted to add what what uh, Luis has been adding. First of all, he does say that he they they add. I know they do a very fine job with a very fine dinner that that gives considerable scholarship amounts, not just you know a few hundred. It gives uh, quite a few uh, uh, scholarship amounts every year to their students of the Portuguese club. But he brings up a good question, which is the question of 
uh, Portuguese kids not taking Portuguese. You know, those who are Portuguese background. It's not the case, you know, at the, where Gonzalo was at, but it's the case here in Tulare. We always knew, Clement and I, would, when we were colleagues, we always knew, well, there's like a, nine or ten of them out there that are not taking Portuguese. We have no idea yeah. why. Uh, you know, um, and um, and he and I'm going to read Luigi's question just the way it is, so those following on social media can see: Are these institutions telling their members to tell their children to take Portuguese? Indeed, yes. Are the halls doing this? Are these institutions, whether they be halls or any other kind of other institution, many Luso American students' children are not interested. I know there are Luso kids at our school who do not take Portuguese. How do we change this? I don't yeah. know. If that's a million dollar question. I have the same thing. I have 25 students, a full class, 27, sorry, at my language class at Fresno State. Like I said, 10 of them are not Portuguese. Okay, 17 are. There certainly are more than 17 students who are Portuguese background at Fresno State. I know at least 50 of them myself. <laughs> They're not taking Portuguese. So I think that, I think that, uh, and I want to ask both of you uh, this question. People have a, a tendency in our community to say, oh, as long as they know a little bit about the, the Festas, as long as they know a little bit about, you know, um, Cristiano Ronaldo being the most awesome soccer player ever, as long as they know about, you know, um, the, 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 the to dance the Vida or the Chamarita, or mm -hmm. as the president of Portugal just took a beating for saying in the East Coast, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but our president, Marcelo Vilso, at the East Coast said to the community, we are Bacalhau. Oh, gosh. And I have this excellent article that I can share with you because someone said, you know, talked about we are not booking any longer because it costs so much darn money in Portugal and with all that. And even and then added that we are not like Cristiano Ronaldo because he's very, very, very um, committed. And a lot of times the Portuguese are. Yeah. The idea is this. Um, I think in our community, and we have, Clement, I'll ask you this part of the question. I think in our community, we have a lot of people that are content saying, oh, as long as they belong to a club XYZ, you know, they're Portuguese, you know, they don't have to learn the language to be Portuguese. And I think you can feel the Portuguese identity without knowing the language, but it's important to know it. I mean, there are certain things that only make sense if you know the language. Well, yes. Uh, well, and um, and um, unfortunately, you know, I've been here doing this for 14 years and I still and I, you know, I'm still very involved in my in our community around here. And but it, it amazes me. It was not too long ago, maybe last month. I had a person and first a very nice person and then it just uh, asked me where uh, I work. I, was, I work for Mission Oak. I'm Oh, uh, what do you do over there? Well, I'm the Portuguese teacher. <laughs> I, I would kind of figured out that people around here had that idea. Um, well, you have enough uh, enough uh, uh, Portuguese uh, kids taking your class. Well, so well, I, I have some, but again, we we'll always have to add. But if I don't have the Hispanic students, again, there he goes. The Hispanic, I wouldn't have enough kids to be. Uh, teaching Portuguese full time like I do right now. So I think there's and, and you've been talking about this for years and years and and whoever wants to listen listens and who doesn't doesn't. Um, uh, that's just the way it is. But our community sometimes closes their ears ears to the, the, these kind of things and they assume they just make that assumption and maybe it's lack of knowledge and they, they don't push themselves to know more that. The only people that, or the only kids or students that are taking Portuguese have to be of of uh, uh, Lusu and that's not the case at all. So there's a little lack of knowledge, I would, for a nice word to say, that in our community sometimes about that. Um, there's a big high, and I like it. For example, if I, you know, I am a, a type of guy who likes touradas and likes. Torch, uh, you know, I know we don't share that, that same view on that, but that's fine. You know, we all have different tastes. So when I go to a vacada, and I don't go to all of them, but when I do go, I, I see all the interest of the young kids. So they love it. It's full, the process full, and they, they enjoy that. 
So that's a, a good thing. It's a culture that's better that they are doing that than causing other problems. So I like that involvement. If it, if it's involved in a mosh, anything that's cultural in a community and the kids are involved, I love it. I think that's great. But then also apply that that you just not that you can make a pass and run around uh, with a with a bull. That you also can compose, read uh, a couple sentence or a poem or a text in the language of your grandparents, of your great grandparents, and that you understand where they that Azores is not a country, but that Azores oh, is. It is. <laughs> <laughs> And so on and so forth. So there's that. And again, like Gonzalo brought it up, you, you know, it's going back in my map and I point, you know, in the beginning of the year and then all through the year, we are uh, spoken in eight different countries and my finger follows through, it comes down through Portugal and all through around Africa. And then we go to Asia and South America. And again, even here in our community, in our Portuguese community, they Really? We, there's uh, there's Portuguese in Africa? Well, yes. You know, there's, so there's got to be that that knowledge, not just the entertainment is good and it's good to be part of the culture, but there's got to be more. Yeah, we're 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 more than that. We're going to be running out of time. I was going to ask about the new world exam, but I know that, uh, of course, um, Gonzalo is not giving it this year because he has, you know, first level students. I know that California had 45. I imagine that most of them were in Polari, not the 144 that was originally given as a mistake, which, by the way, Portugal never said it was a mistake. They blamed it on the uh, uh, on, on Newell. Uh, but um, but the numbers are not great. I, if, I think that Luis is still on. Maybe he can add to how many students or if he had any this year for the International Baccarat. Our issue, folks, and just I don't want to beat up on the abatermos taguinho como se diz em português or on the same issue. But our issue is until Newell is accepted by the universities, it's never going to be really a big test because it, uh, it, any student is going to take an AP test. Uh, he or she's going to take it because he wants to get some college credits. Um, and right now, Newell is not accepted by any of the CSUs, and that's 23 campuses. It's not accepted that we know of by any UCs. The other day, Luis Gonçalves, who is a Portuguese, uh, a leader in the Portuguese organi uh, teachers organization, I know that uh, Clemente has met Luis. He's a, he was for many years the president of the Association of Portuguese Language Teachers. I think he taught at, uh, and still does teach at Columbia. Um, and um, and runs a couple other programs. And Luis was saying that the only university that takes a carte blanche is BYU, um, Brigham Young University, uh, uh, because uh, of the Mormon Church and the and, and the and the the aspect. Actually, of the students who took Newell a test, 159 uh, of the 370 were from Utah because they are interested when they're adults in doing a mission in a Portuguese speaking country. And it's a very legitimate uh, reason. Um, Luis, IB test from last year, 15 students took, 13 passed. That's great. And they also received, of course, uh, their um, uh, seal of biliteracy besides, of course, the IB, which the IB is recognized, International Baccarat. And if the students pass it, they get it. They get their units in a college. So, Clement, I know you had a few of, of your students take it, and the district as well, right? I actually had a whole paragraph written about Newell. Well, oh, then you, you better have oh, that paragraph. Oh my goodness! I, I actually we'll, could spend, we'll, we'll, I, I wanna, could spend I a couple look. hours on Newell, really. But well, we don't uh, want to spend I'll, a couple I'll, hours. But I, I don't want to spend a couple hours. But I'll pinpoint a couple of things. Uh, we've and we've talked about these uh, things uh, over the years. Um, I'm more and more uh, not happy with Newell. I knew Newell, uh, before Newell came along, uh, the seal of bad literacy, especially for Portuguese language, because there wasn't a Portuguese test like Newell. It was, you took four years of Portuguese, you required your seal of bad literacy. Then I think it was five or six years ago, the new Portugal came up or the uh, American Council came up with Yes, will apply to our students. I personally, I, I had one student that took it. She passed it. Hispanic student passed it with a four. Okay. Um, I know my other colleagues. I can, I can vouch. I could count for them. 
uh, they were not so successful. I, one school had 14 take the test, one passed. Another school had 24 take the test and four passed. That is not a good number in, in one out of 14 and so on and so forth. Um, there's there's uh, issues. I've had students who sometimes come in um, later. Maybe they don't take Portuguese one, but then they take Portuguese um, uh, well, they come in as a sophomore, so they take Portuguese one, two, and three, so they're not able to take the four years. And I've had those students take the new and pass it, but at the same time, they can't get the seal of biliteracy because our rule is that you have to have um, uh, four years of language and pass the new to get the seal of biliteracy. I've asked around of, of the students in our district that have passed and that have gone to universities, what has been their benefit, what they have what, to them? I haven't encountered one. I, I know of one student that they were able to skip a class at a junior college and take another cl Portuguese class instead of maybe a level one, they took a level two, but that is not the what it should be for. When students take the, AP Spanish, they don't have to take four years, but again, it's because the AP Spanish or the new is not valued like the AP Spanish. That's why we have to take the four years. So there's a lot of things like that. I had students who took four years, passed the new with a four, and were not allowed because there's a component that they have to pass the CASP, they were not allowed to get the seal by literacy they were really upset because they they showed proficiency by taking that test in the language and they still were not able to get the seal of biliteracy. And most of these kids are looking for the seal of biliteracy. They're actually, especially in high school because they like their medal when they graduate and stuff like that. But it's not about the... That actually really bugs me is I've asked questions last month. I emailed a person, Uma Shamsi. Shamsi. I've never you know, asked a question. I had a concern. I haven't heard anything from her. Uh, she's directed me to another professor somewhere else. Uh, haven't heard anything from them. But I would assume, Nish, that if it was BYU emailing them, I think they probably would have got a response. So I'll leave it at that. <laughs> leave it at that. Well, the new will needs to be worked. There's lots of issues. Um, no student from, it was, it's, I have the numbers and I can share with all of you. I mean, they're public. Um, no student from Rhode Island, which was amazing. Not one single student from Rhode Island took the test. Not one, not one from Rhode Island. I mean, that's uh, the second most sp spoken language in Rhode Island is Portuguese. It's the only state in the union that the yeah. second most spoken language after English is, is, is not Spanish. It's, it's, uh, it's Portuguese. Um, now, one student from Connecticut that has a very strong uh, Portuguese community from mainland Portugal, especially from the northern part of Braga. And so, um, so there's a lot of work that, that needs to yeah. be done. And as long as we just you know, sweep it under the carpet, something <laughs> will happen. Um, you know, uh, and unfortunately here in California, if it's not accepted by a CSU or a UC, then students are not gonna find any value in any test that they can take for what? Um, and skipping a class, yeah. I mean, if a student comes to me, I just had one last semester who came to me and said, hey, I took three years of Portuguese at Turlock High School. I wanna take Portuguese 1B. I don't wanna take 1A. I said, of course, I don't want you in 1A. <laughs> I'm like, if you took three years of Portuguese, I want you in 1B. Uh, but he didn't get the, but he didn't get the units for 1A. Okay, exactly. so if he had passed the, a test that's accepted by the state, then he would have got the three units or the four units for 1A. That's the And issue. Nish, I will finish off with this. And I I believe, and this actually goes back to the one of the second questions here about numbers. I actually, I, this is my belief that I don't have proof for of anything, but this is actually, I think, causing a certain number of, of, of losing our numbers. Because now all of a sudden, they feel, oh, I, I, before they would just say, I'm taking four years, I'm going to get the CO literacy. Right now, I have five students that were in Portuguese three decided not to take Portuguese four this year because 
you know, they, they didn't want to take the test. They didn't want to, want to do the fork. There was a bunch of combination. But I think this is actually affecting for those that are going to continue from level three, four, one. It is actually affecting the situation, I believe, in our area. Yeah, indeed. I mean, we have to create more opportunities, as uh, Gonzalo said, and easier things and funner things and not put, you know, uh, more roadblocks, you know. Uh, I mean, we have to create bigger opportunities. So thank you both. We're going to end. And thank you, Luis, also. Um, um, and uh, thank you all for participating, those of you who are following us on social media outlets. Um, uh, 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 Gonzalo was, was, uh, was, uh, was laughing when... Uh, when Clement was explaining, you know, why we went from the Portuguese club to Sopush, uh, Society of Portuguese American Students. Um, the alternative was, was even worse, okay? <laughs> well, the alternative was to keep the Portuguese club, but we wanted something different. And actually that name came not for me, it came from uh, a, a Portuguese uh, a teacher, um, a Portuguese uh, ancestor teacher who teaches English at Mission Oak, and that is Diane Heish. She was at the time teaching Portuguese in um, Hilmar. Uh, she taught Portuguese there, I believe, for a year, I think it was. Or, and they were involved in the Portuguese club, and, you know, there were all these different names. The other one is because, of course, this is a very uh, Zorian community, as, uh, as uh, Gonzalo knows from his travels. Um, and so they wanted to put the name Azores in there, and so they, we had thought about this one that was that uh, Hilmar was thinking about it, but we wanted to be more inclusive, you know, Portuguese Americans, you know, uh, Portuguese and Americans, independently of what you are. The other one was called Sociedad Estudantil de Cultura Suriana or SICA. And that would oh, have been sick. Hey, SICA. Sick. <laughs> <laughs> Not good, no. <laughs> no washers, so Lovely, brilliant names, but I have to say that Sopush, the Sopush Club might be the best named club I've ever heard of. That's <laughs> oh, yeah. brilliant. That's brilliant. <laughs> well, yeah, I can't tell you, Gonzalo, how many times when we changed that many years ago that people would email me and say, When when is your Sopush? When are you having when are you serving the Sopush? No, no, no. It's the name of the club. Gonzalo, best of luck to you. I know you are a NASA to the Portuguese language. We're so happy and so proud that you've decided to teach one course of Portuguese because you could teach them anything else you wanted. You could actually teach, um, I don't know, you could teach quantum physics, you know, because you're so enthused about everything and, and you're very knowledgeable. <laughs> it would be great to have a, 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 my my dream would be all of a sudden, and you're an illusionist, maybe you can make some magic. We, we, we need about, um, not many, but about 75 Gonçalves throughout California. We'd be okay. <laughs> so, uh, see if that if we can put some magic there. Clement, thank you so much for all of your work. Thank you for your commitment. Thank you for your uh, honesty with these numbers. Thank you for um, continuing uh, the the Portuguese and, and being actually usually the teacher with the most number of Portuguese students at at. Uh, at, at uh, Tolerary Joint Union High School District, a, a school that has probably the least number of Portuguese Americans, uh, which is Mission Oak High School. Uh, so thank you for your, thank you and congratulations. Thanks to all of you who joined us. Folks, please, 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 if you are Portuguese background and you have a way that your son or your daughter, your grandson or your granddaughter can learn some Portuguese at a California public high school, get on the bandwagon, let's start it. We have still a group of people like Clement, like Luis. Thank you so much, Luis, for being so patient with us. Um, I wanted to, um, uh, so we have people like Luis, like Clement, with a lot of experience. We have, we have the talented Gonzalo, you know, which will have a lot of experience in a couple of years as well, and who are committed. And so we have these opportunities. It would just, it's just up to each and every one of us to think a little bit more that, being Portuguese is a is an identity, obviously, first and foremost, and it can be expressed in any language. You know, you can be Portuguese and only speak Chinese, but but knowing a little bit, because as Gonzalo and Clement both mentioned, you just don't learn Portuguese. You learn geography. You learn cultural traditions. You learn about a little bit about a hi the history of the of the nation and the nations that the country that uses Portuguese language. So you certainly perfect 
you certainly help your child or your grandchild by enrolling him or her in a Portuguese language class. Again, thank you all very, very much. On behalf of Luis. It was all a pleasure to meet you. Luis, sorry I didn't get to see you today. It was nice uh, reading your chat. That's right. We miss Luis. Uh, thank you so much to all of you. Appreciate it. Obrigado. Obrigado a todos. Obrigadíssimo. Um abraço.